Good morning. My name is Rob, and I will be your conference operator today. At this time, I'd like to welcome everyone to the Exact Sciences fourth quarter 2022 earnings conference call. All lines have been placed on mute to prevent any background noise. After the speaker's remarks, there will be a question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question during this time, simply press star followed by the number one on your telephone keypad. If you would like to withdraw your question, again, press the star one. Thank you, Megan Jones, Senior Director, Investor Relations. You may begin your conference. Thanks, Rob. Thank you for joining us for Exact Sciences fourth quarter 2022 conference call. On the call today are Kevin Conroy, the company's chairman and CEO, and Jeff Elliott, our chief financial officer and chief operating officer. Everett Cunningham, our chief commercial officer, will also be available for questions. Exact Sciences issued a news release earlier this afternoon detailing our fourth quarter financial results. This news, this news release and today's presentation are available on our website at exactsciences.com. During today's call, we will make forward-looking statements based on current expectations. Our actual results may have material differences from such statements. Discussions of non-GAAP figures and reconciliations to GAAP figures are available in our earnings press release, and descriptions of the risks and uncertainties associated with exact sciences are included in our SEC filings. Both can be accessed through our website. I'll now turn the call over to Kevin. The strength of our foundation supporting the best brands in cancer diagnostics puts us in a leading position to continue delivering innovative cancer tests, consistent revenue growth, and profitability. We are using this platform to help prevent cancer, detect it earlier, and guide treatment for more patients globally. Achievements in 2022 that help strengthen our leadership include surpassing 12 million cumulative people tested for cancer, including 10 million with Colgar, expanding our global network of ordering healthcare professionals to more than 350,000, growing core revenue 380 million year over year, becoming adjusted EBITDA profitable in the fourth quarter, Completing enrollment of Blue Sea, our pivotal study to support our next generation colon guard and colon cancer blood tests. And generating evidence for our multi-cancer early detection and molecular residual disease tests. Over the past decade, we've built a high quality platform to deliver advanced cancer tests at scale. We've invested heavily in our people, lab infrastructure, technology systems, clinical evidence, brands, and customer experience. This platform is fueling efficient growth for our current tests, and over time it will fuel, fuel the next wave of novel cancer diagnostics. Our health system customers employ most U.S. healthcare professionals and seek to improve the quality of care while reducing costs. They are incentivized to focus on preventive care, including cancer screenings. Today, many face a staff shortage leading to a trend of more in-home services, such as Colocard. Advanced cancer testing. Uh, in advanced cancer testing, health systems continue to ask for fewer partners to meet their needs. Uh, a complete range of high-quality, impactful tests, broad insurance coverage, EMR integration, and data sharing capabilities. Exact Sciences is uniquely positioned to deliver on these needs because we have the broadest offering of innovative cancer tests, patient-focused services, EMR integration capabilities, and payer relationships. This year, we'll increase adoption of ColorGuard and Ocotide DX, create an even better customer experience, and advance our key pipeline programs in colorectal cancer, multi-cancer early detection, and molecular residual disease. Jeff will now discuss our financial results and outlook for 2023. Thanks, Kevin. Good afternoon. Fourth quarter revenue of $553 million grew 17%, or 28% excluding COVID testing. Screening revenue of $404 million increased 45%, including three points of growth from conventional genetics. For the year, screening revenue increased 30% organically. During the quarter, 10,000 new healthcare professionals ordered Cologuard, bringing the total to more than 302,000 since launch. Precision oncology revenue decreased 4% to $143 million. Excluding the sale of our prostate business in a $2 million FX headwind, growth was 1%. Cologuard 
COVID testing revenue decreased 87% to 6 million. Fourth quarter gap gross margin was 70%. Non gap gross margin, excluding the amortization of acquired intangibles, was 73%. Net loss was 128 million. Adjusted EBITDA was 5 million, an improvement of 120 million, demonstrating the power of the exact sciences platform. We ended the year with cash and securities of about 630 million. Our total liquidity is about 840 million, including available credit facilities. Turning to the guidance, we expect total revenue between 536 and 551 million during the first quarter, and 2.265 and 2.315 billion for the year. This assumes screening revenue between 390 and 400 million for the first quarter, and 1.66 to 1.69 billion for the year. Precision oncology revenue between 143 and 148 million for the first quarter, and 600 to 620 million for the year. And COVID revenue of 3 million for the first quarter, and 5 million for the year. For the year, this implies 18% growth for screening, 5% growth for precision oncology, excluding the sale of our prostate business, and 14% overall growth, excluding COVID testing and the prostate sale. We exited last year with broad momentum, which is driving a strong first quarter. This is especially true in our screening business, where we're seeing the benefits of past investments and great execution from our team. We expect to generate up to 25 million of adjusted EBITDA for the year. This assumes non-gap gross margin of about 73% for the year. Our industry-leading gross margins are powering positive adjusted EBITDA and a clear path to free cash flow as we continue investing in growth and efficiencies. We expect total gap OPEX to increase mid-single digits for the year. This includes an absolute decrease in sales and marketing, offset by increased G&A and R&D. Last year, G&A was reduced by $57 million, primarily from a non-cash gain related to the Thrive acquisition earnout. In addition to cycling against that gain this year, we expect $19 million in non-cash expense as we accrue for the earnout payment. R&D is increasing to support our multi-cancer and MRD programs. We expect CapEx this year to be about $120 million. I'll now turn the call back to Kevin. Thanks, Jeff. Colovert is becoming the preferred colorectal cancer screening choice. During the fourth quarter, nearly 160,000 healthcare professionals ordered Colovert, a new record, and the rate of people rescreening hit an all time high. We are starting 2023 with tailwinds, including stronger healthcare professional conviction in Colovert as our frontline screening test. Increased consumer awareness, improved electronic ordering, and an enhanced digital patient experience. Also reached half a million people screened with Colaguard between ages 45 and 49. As of the fourth quarter, we estimate Colaguard grew to 9% penetration of the more than 90 million people ages 50 to 85 in the colon cancer screening market. For the nearly 20 million 45 to 49 year olds, penetration grew to more than 8%. Just 18 months after it was included, uh, that age group was included in USPSTF guidelines. Screening people in their mid to late 40s will provide recurring revenue for decades as we work to keep them screening every three years until they're 85. Colaguard growth is supported by the most powerful sales and marketing team in cancer diagnostics. We engage with healthcare professionals more than 1 million times each year and have more than double the revenue gener generated per interaction in the past year. We build brand recognition and loyalty by generating more than 15 billion impressions annually. Our commercial team, supported by rigorous analytics, will get even more efficient over time and help decrease sales and marketing costs as a percent of revenue while supporting growth. Our precision oncology team has guided treatment decisions for more than 1.75 million cancer patients around the world, including a record 220,000 people last year. Oncotype DX revolutionized breast cancer care it is internationally recognized as standard of care for patients with early stage HR positive HER2 negative breast cancer, which represents about half of breast cancer cases. We have an opportunity to impact even more lives by making Octite DX easily accessible to more women globally, 
offering onco extra our enhanced therapy selection test with DNA and RNA analysis, and working with our biopharma partners to develop new targeted cancer therapeutics. Thanks to our team, Trusted Oncotype DX brand, and deep oncology relationships, we can power better treatment decisions that are specific to each patient's disease. Our advanced R&D expertise in platform screening, screening and precision oncology will help get our pipeline tests to more patients quickly. We made meaningful progress in each of our key pipeline programs last year by completing the enrollment of our Blue Sea Pivotal trial, which included more than 26,000 people. Presenting two studies, including 4,200 samples, showing the power of our multi-cancer early detection test, and initiating and enrolling studies that will answer key questions clinicians and payers have when evaluating our molecular residual disease tests. We are completing the final steps of our Blue Sea trial and expect to have top line next generation guard data mid 2023 before submitting to the FDA for approval. We expect to have two additional sets of multi cancer early detection data this year further validating our multi-marker class approach before we move to a larger prospective trial. We also plan to validate and make our tumor-informed molecular residual disease test available to colon cancer patients later this year. Our mission is to make earlier detection a routine part of medical care to help eradicate our platform, deeply embedded standard of care tests, and pipeline of life-changing diagnostics will power years of growth and continued profitability, helping us to achieve our mission. Thank you. We're happy to open the line for questions. At this time, I would like to remind everyone, in order to ask a question, press star, then the number one on your telephone keypad. We ask that you limit yourself to one question only with no follow-up questions. Your first question comes from a line of Derek DeBruin from Bank of America. Your line is open. Derek DeBruin, your line is open. Hi, it's Derek. Sorry about that. I had the mute on. So, um, so can you just so a couple of points, so a couple of questions. I think the first one is, I guess, what were the key market changes that drove some of the increased momentum in Q4? And you know, uh, the guide was better than expected, particularly for Cologuard in for 2023, and that's one. And then just. I've gotten a bunch of questions from investors lately about the competitive landscape outside of liquid biopsy. There's a couple of companies that are advancing some of their stool-based colon cancer screening tests, and also just sort of the landscape for Oncotype as it sort of goes OUS. There's a little bit more competitive um, opportunities out there. Can you just sort of talk through the, um, those couple of questions? Thanks, then I'll shut up. Well, let's, um, let's first address the uh, the momentum that we saw uh, throughout the fourth quarter and the start of the year. Um, a lot of this is just the result of the investments that we have made over time, um, the, the strong need for uh, non-invasive uh, screening, uh, colon cancer screening tools. So you have some structural uh, tailwinds, including the ease of, of electronic ordering that has taken um, you know, a significant amount of effort, time, engagement with large health systems to uh, deliver electronic ordering through our uh, EPIC uh, and uh, EMR capabilities, uh, increased brand awareness around ColoGuard. Health systems um, are highly incented to uh, drive their colon cancer screening uh, scores, and they're frequently now reaching out to us to ask uh, for a partner who can help them. Uh, improve their quality measures, care gaps, et cetera. Um, we're seeing uh, uh, GIs have a staff shortage, and there's a greater focus in the endoscopy suite on uh, uh, diagnostic colonoscopies, and GIs are, are ordering uh, Cologuard at a higher rate as uh, uh, primary care physicians are, um, certainly. 
Um, our sales and marketing team, I just can't uh, tell you how proud we are of the work that they uh, have done and continue to do. Uh, the, their efficiency, their engagement is uh, turning the tide and um, really making Color Guard um, a, a first line screening choice. Um, also, of course, the 45 to 49 year uh, age group. Uh, 18 months ago, the guidelines changed to a uh, lower from age 50 to 45. And we believe ColoGuard um, is leading in terms of market share today, and, and the penetration is um, is impressive. If you take the fourth quarter uh, number of tests and um, extrapolate that, we we believe where the penetration is uh, about eight percent, as I mentioned earlier. Jeff, I, I don't know if you want to add any color to that. It's just as Anna what Kevin said, uh, electronic ordering just a huge. Huge uh, year last year. Recall when we started the, the pandemic back in early 20, 30% of cold good orders were electronic. In Q4, that was up to 63%. So yeah, that has implications not only for cold guard, you make it easier to get orders. It has implications down the road as we launch new products, they'll, they'll launch right into that foundation. So overall, deeper connections to health systems. In Q4, I think as we talked before, Derek, um, we picked up a, a little bit of extra upside. From enhancements we made both to our, our patient compliance engine and our billing systems. So again, these, these added to the upside, they weren't the, the sole cause of it. Uh, the reason I bring those up is because uh, when we added these enhancements, which will benefit on a run rate basis, we'll get, we'll get better compliance and better uh, kind of better ASPs going forward. When we added those enhancements, we took we pulled forward a bit of revenue from Q2 and Q3. So, so consider that catch-up revenue. Uh, that add a little bit more in Q4. So you really can't take Q4 and extrapolate that. Um, now when I, I've got uh, half of Q, Q1 in the books now, um, I think a little bit of that catch-up revenue, again, from the billing enhancements, patient compliance enhancements, is spilling into Q1. So it's part of the strength in Q1. And then just everything Kevin said uh, should continue. Um, I know there's questions on competition. Yeah, in terms of uh, competitive uh, dynamics, when you look at Colgard, uh, Cologuard uh, set a standard of, uh, of care and a very high bar in colon cancer screening. Uh, Cologuard 2.0, or what we call the next uh, generation Cologuard, will raise that bar. Um, and uh, we just haven't seen um, data indicating any other testing modality that, uh, that approaches that high level of performance for detecting cancer for detecting uh, precancerous polyps and uh, and having a high specificity rate. And you have to be careful when you take a look at data. Is it apples to apples? What are the underlying drivers? How large is the study? How well powered, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so we feel great about the uh, competitive positioning. There's so much more to Cologuard than uh, the test. There's a, a enormous investment, altogether about a billion dollars invested in an IT infrastructure, a commercial team, uh, a lab uh, uh, team and capability that is uh, requires a you know multi-billion dollar investment to, um, to to be able to reach uh, the hundreds of thousands of ordering healthcare providers and the tens of millions of patients. Um, Oncotype DX is in, uh, is in a class of its own. It's the only test uh, with the, uh, the level of evidence that you've seen with Taylor X and Responda. As a result, it has a leading uh, position in the in U.S. and um, uh, and global. So uh, these are the two best brands in diagnostics. We will keep investing in them, um, and they have become. Um, uh, standard of, of care without peer in terms of that uh, Cologuard and its sample type and Oncotype DX would be very difficult to replicate that level of evidence. So we're proud of these programs and continue to expect big things in the future. Your next question comes from a line of Andrew Brackman from William Blair. Your line is open. Hi guys, good afternoon. Thanks for taking the question. Um, Kevin, maybe one for you and sort of building off some of that stool-based commentary there. Uh, just sort of recognizing 2.0 data is going to come, I think you said, around mid-year. Can you just sort of give us an update on where you expect those data to come in 
anything in particular you'd point to as we put together those scorecards for that data and sort of the longer term benefit to the model? Thanks. We expect ColorGuard 2.0 to have improved specificity, so a more false positive rate. And we um, uh, would, on a secondary basis, would hope to see um, some improvement in the advanced adenoma detection rate. The, the main goal is to uh, lower the false positive rate. Uh, we have designed ColorGuard with uh, uh, more specific markers. Uh, we also expect to see improved uh, cost efficiencies um, and other aspects of, of, of ColorGuard testing. So that is um, where we, um, that's what we expect. Of course, we won't know until we uh, complete all, all of the, um, the validation testing, uh, and, and we expect that to uh, occur mid-year. Your next question comes from the line of Dan Brennan from Cowan. Your line is open. Great, thanks for uh, thanks for the questions, guys. Um, maybe um, first one just on the rescreen in the forty-five to forty-nine, and then just one question on the EBITDA guidance for twenty-three. So, Jeff, can you just clarify? So, eight percent penetration run rate in four Q seems like a really big number. We're coming out like one hundred thirty thousand tests. Is that in the zip code? It's what twenty million people in total. And you divide that by three to get the addressable for Cologuard, so that's like 6.6 .6 million on a, and then you got eight percent, and then you got eight percent penetration in four Q. So we just took a quarter of that and eight percent of that. So maybe, maybe maybe a little clarity on the math there, and how we and and you know kind of how we think about. It. I know you guys don't want to disclose too much on these, uh, but since they are material, it'd be great to understand how you're thinking about the impact for rescreen in 45 to 49 in 2023. And then there's the second one would just be on the 25 million plus of adjusted EBITDA, um, um, I guess dollars, the uh, X style comp in 2023. So if you exited 4Q with 5 million, just wondering if that's a conservative number, since you, I would expect you guys would have some nice momentum um, despite all the investments that you're doing. So I would, I would have thought it'd be a high number in 23. Maybe you could just speak through some of the drivers there. Thank you. Uh, sure, a, a lot there. Um, obviously, Kevin talked about 45 and rescreen just being significant growth drivers, and that will continue for a long time. Um, last year, we had put up guidance for 45 of at least 100 million of revenue. We, we beat that nicely. And for rescreens, we said at least 220 million, and we beat that nicely. So both are, have really good momentum. This year, we expect rescreens to be about 20% of revenue in total, and that should grow from there. Eventually, this becomes half our revenue. And uh, 45 should have a, a pretty similar trajectory as three streets. So huge drivers there. In Q4, um, you know, Kevin talked about the, the, the overall penetration rate for 45. And just to be clear on the definition here, we're looking at the pool of patients, which is nearly 20 million people, and saying that Q4 run rate, call it roughly 125,000 people tested. If you adjust that for the interval and the annualize it, um, we were at about 8% penetration into that younger age group. The reason we highlighted that is because uh, COVID got there in about 18 months after USPSDF guideline inclusion for the younger age group. You, can, you contrast that to the 50 and above age group, which is that's been you know, the biggest diagnostic launch in history. We're at 9% there today. So the point there is really 45 is growing very, very quickly. Um, the question on adjusted EBITDA, um, what we're guiding to is uh, flat to uh, 25 million of just EBITDA for the year. Um, this, you know, this really speaks to the power of the platform. You, know, we, you recall that we had accelerated the path of profitability. It was going to be 24, then mid 23, and eventually we got there uh, in, in the end of 22. For the year now, what we're, what we're guiding to is over 150 million of just EBITDA growth. On an incremental adjusted EBITDA margin basis, we're talking of over 75% incremental. So uh, the guidance is the most likely outcome. I'm proud of what the team has delivered here. Um, these are, yeah, I'm very proud of these numbers. It's, it's significant improvement year on year. And it puts us in a position to really continue investing in growth and efficiencies and delivering profitability to investors. Your next question comes from a line of Vijay Kumar from Evercore ISI. Your line is open. Hey guys, thanks for taking my question. Um, 
Jeff, uh, one and um, your, your um, I, I guess I had a two part question. This 2.0, um, um, call of our 2.0 results, I, I know you mentioned increased specificity. Um, and you expect an increase in advanced noma sensitivity. Is, is there any risk as you take up that specificity that the sensitivity for uh, cancer perhaps it, um, you know, drops? Um, and I know given AA sensitivity going up, perhaps that's not the case, but maybe just talk to us. Is there any risk here from a sensitivity perspective heading into these results and, and, and unadjusted EBITDA, Jeff? Uh, how should we think about those uh, leverage levels going forward? The incremental uh, leverage map that you just laid out, should that hold true when we think about uh, 24 and 25? Thank you. Why don't I take the first part, Jeff, and you take the second part. Um, so we would expect the cancer sensitivity to be um, at or above uh, 90%. Um, we would expect somewhere in the neighborhood of 100 uh, cancer samples uh, in the study. So it's, it's in the, as you recall, in the deep sea study, we had 65 samples. So what have we done to in, uh, improve the likelihood of success? We, number one, in, uh, increased the powering of the study. Number two, we've done a significant amount of work to compare uh, the current version of Cologuard with the next generation version of Cologuard in uh, samples, including samples from the deep sea study. So we have a head-to-head -head comparison, which gives us confidence that uh, Cologuard uh, 2.0 is performs better than Cologuard 1.0. You can never control all of the risk because if the fundamental population is changed, or for example, you see a lot more smaller cancers, harder to detect cancers, um, you don't know that and you can't control for it. Um, so what we have done is uh, developed the very best test with the best markers, the, the um, most efficient and powerful DNA capture technologies and deployed that into the study. And we look forward to opening uh, the, the results of, of the study and sharing them with you. Uh, and that's our thinking on that. Jeff, maybe you take the second one. Yeah, uh, this is Jeff. On the leverage question, like this, this model was then built to scale, uh, to scale efficiently, and ultimately deliver positive free cash flow, which we expect to, uh, to reach in 24. Um, can we sustain 75% plus incrementals? Um, I hope so, but that, that's, a, that's a pretty tall order, DJ. Um, you know, when I think about leverage going forward, the best way to do it is to drive a really strong top line. I know every team are going to do that. Um, we've got some nice levers to pull when I walk through the P&L thinking of, of gross margin. We're targeting over 80% gross margin for, for the two key products here, Cologar and Oncotype. Oncotype is there. Uh, I'm confident Cologar will get there over time. So I expect some good gross margin improvement. Um, the GNA. Um, you know, the, this year, I talked about that, that Thrive Burnout payment is driving higher GNA growth on a gap basis, but the adjust for that is, is mid single digit growth. Um, over time, the GNA leverage will improve. Sales and marketing, um, you know, the mandate there is really to, to make sure we're always investing in the smart growth and never done a nice job there. Uh, so we're seeing that a really good leverage uh, within sales and marketing. R&D, uh, the way we'll get leverage there is, is to focus on the highest impact uh, opportunities, and, and Kevin has talked about those today. Um, over time, as we get uh, the benefit, Cologuard 2, uh, the MRD programs, multi-cancer, as we get the benefit from those programs, that, help, that will help drive additional leverage through the P&L. Your next question comes from a line of Catherine Schulte from Baird. Your line is open. Hey, guys. Thanks for the question. Um, and thanks for showing that slide on, on rep productivity. It's great to see Cologuard revenue per field call continuing to trend upwards. But I'm curious, you know, what that number would have looked like pre-COVID and if you can talk to where you think that number should go over time. Yeah, uh, yeah Kevin, this is Jeff. Um, you know, Pre-COVID, I think there's a lot of moving pieces there. You know, when you think of the, the Pfizer relationship, uh, it's a great partnership. It, it just does change the dynamic as well. Uh, which is why we focused on the quarters that we did displayed on the slide deck. Going forward, where can it go? Uh, I, I can start, but ever, you know, please chime in. And 
there's a, a long ways to grow when you, when you think of that market penetration number, you know, 9% and that 50 plus age group. Longer term, um, I'm confident we can get to at least 40%. And I think we've already got a strong team in place. So I, I expect that productivity to go way up over time. But yeah, No, thanks, Jeff. And thanks, Catherine, for the question. Um, I'm really proud of what the commercial team has done over the past year since we've launched ColorGuard. And we continue to evolve the commercial team. There's many things that are contributing uh, to the productivity. I'll, I'll just highlight a couple of things. Number one is uh, the way in which we've evolved our territories. We've cleaned up the overlap in territories, which have driven deeper customer relations. Um, and I think that's driving a lot of the acceptance of why now Colgar is a preferred choice for screening. Um, number two, we use data and analytics now in terms of who to call on, when to call on, how often we call on those customers. And we're just much better now at looking and, and knowing exactly who to call on for the growth. And we review those analytics and who we're calling on on a weekly and monthly, very rigorous process in our commercial organization. We just don't do it centrally, but we're, we're now doing it at the market and area level uh, where that execution is happening. Um, and then, you know, Jeff mentioned, Kevin mentioned in terms of we're going to always invest for growth. We're really focused on health systems. Um, that's where a lot of our customers and, and patients are. Uh, we've increased our amount of account executives at the health systems level. And the conversations now that we're having around the screening is our health systems are now coming to us. And how can we partner for those hard to screen patients where they need to close the care gaps? We saw a lot of that at the tail end of 2022, and that's going to continue in 2023. I feel bullish that our productivity will continue to improve. Your next question comes from a line of Brandon Kiard from Jeffries. Your line is open. Hey, thanks. Good afternoon. Um, just a two-part question in terms of the guide for the year. Jeff, what's embedded for the stock comp expense? And then, Kevin, conceptually speaking, if the top line is, let's say, running ahead of plan as we move through the year, would it be your preference to reinvest some of those dollars but still deliver on the profitability target, or would you let that drop down? Thanks. Uh, so, Brad, this is Jeff. I think the first one on stock comp. Um, I think we've, we've given you the you know, kind of all the, the pieces between when you look at um, a, the gap, the uh, single digit growth, and OPEX, and just even downside. I think you can, stock comp is, is probably the, the biggest uh, piece between there. Uh, if you look at last year, which you have, you'll have in the case, you don't already, uh, it's going to grow from there as, uh, um, as the, if you look back at the headcount growth over time. Um, I think that that's enough to give you all the, uh, the math between the gap number and the just EBITDA number. Second question on reinvestment. So um, in terms of investment, we're still making enormous investments in new product programs. We've touched upon the three big ones, colon cancer, multi-cancer early detection, and um, the MRD program. So uh, we also have some um, minor programs that we're working on in uh, liver, esophageal cancer, and endometrial cancer. Um, we're making those investments today. We're making significant investments in our IT uh, infrastructure. So would we selectively um, reinvest uh, some of those profits? Yes. Are we uh, biased towards and leaning towards letting that flow through? Uh, the answer is yes, the whole company is um, on board with that. They're driving to it. They're, we're, um, we're all rolling together as one team to um, show the profitability engine that uh, we have, and, and that's very important to us. Your next question comes from a line of Matt Sykes from Goldman Sachs. Your line is open. Hi, good afternoon. Thanks for taking my questions. Maybe the first one just on compliance. Jeff, you mentioned some of the enhancements you were making to compliance, and if we add in the rescreen opportunity um, over time, could you maybe help us frame where you think compliance can go to for ColaGuard over the next year or two? And then, and just secondly, I'll ask them both up front, but secondly, just on um, Oncotype outside of the U.S., I think you mentioned that's sort of a main growth area for you. Could you maybe talk about what you see as sort of the growth rate for XUS within Oncotype um, for this year? Thanks. 
Yeah, this is Jeff. I think I'll handle both of those. Um, Colgard patient compliance, the way we typically report this out is looking at tests uh, test sent out 12 to 18 months prior. Um, that rate is in the mid 60s percent, but so about two out of three patients uh, comply with Colgard. Over time, I expect that to go above 70, possibly to 75. Uh, the reason why I'm confident we'll get there is that on, uh, on rescreen patients, uh, the overall patient compliance rate is 15 to 20 points higher than first time patients. So over time, um, that's going to be a big driver of overall lift in the patient compliance rate. And we're making significant investments uh, to enhance that customer experience. Uh, better ways for outreach, better ways to make it even simpler to do Cologuard. And over time, uh, that will naturally bring that patient compliance rate up. Um, the second question on Octotype DX international growth. Um, there's, there's a significant runway ahead. Um, thanks to the strength of the, the team there, the strength of the evidence that Kevin alluded to, um, Oncotype globally is, is opening up in new markets uh, through reimbursement and access. Um, what we baked into this year is, um, in the U.S., uh, growth there is, is approaching prevalence plus a point or so. So think of kind of low to mid single digits. Um, international will grow faster. Um, it can be easily into the double digits depending on new markets that launch within a given year. Uh, this year, we expect Japan, which could eventually be the biggest market outside the U.S., we expect Japan to come on potentially mid-year, um, and that can be a big driver um, starting mid-year and into next year. Your next question comes from the line of Jack Meehan from Nephron Research. Your line is open. Thanks. Good afternoon. Uh, my questions for Kevin are on the blood screening programs. First, uh, can you give an update on the blood portion of Blue C when you expect that to read out? And then second, on MCAD, talked about validating um, additional markers. Can you just talk about um, you know, how that might be similar or different to what you presented at ESMO and um, what that might mean for timeline for the SOAR study? Sure. Um, on the first program, we haven't given specific guidance as to uh, when the colon cancer blood program will read out. Uh, the team that is focused on our colon cancer programs are focused both on uh, stool, um, colon 2.0, and blood. Um, the, there's a huge amount of effort that is required to um, uh, prior to testing samples, so there is um, a rigorous uh, analytical set of analytical validation studies that are required, uh, verification studies, software uh, development and, and um, validation, um, and uh, so there is an enormous amount of rigor that goes into that in preparing the automation um, um, entire program and submission that goes to the FDA. You don't make changes easily, uh, so you need to make sure that, that um, the manufacturing capability and all the studies are locked down. So the Cologuard 2.0 or next generation Cologuard is first, and then that team will shift its focus to the um, validation and verification um, studies for CRC blood afterwards. Um, in the coming quarters will provide more clarity as to when that um, pivotal study from the blood portion of the CRC program will be complete. Uh, in terms of the MSED uh, marker validation study, we have um, uh, interim and full uh, readouts of uh, the test design, kind of lockdown study uh, prior to moving into the large prospective study. That uh, study we expect to uh, read out um, uh, uh, this year. So two different studies will read out uh, during the year, and that is a much larger version of the data that you saw at ESMO last year. Um, that is that will lock down our, our final marker classes, um, and then we expect uh, SOAR to start um, next year. Uh, uh, we would expect that to start in the first half of next year. And um, all of the, the team right now is working on perfecting the test, making sure that that test and the automation surrounding it uh, is locked down before we start that study. Again, once you start a prospective study, 
or a cancer screening test. You don't make changes to that product, so it's totally locked up. Your next question comes from the line of Mark Mazzaro from BTIG. Your line is open. Hey, guys. Uh, thanks for the questions, and congrats on the progress. Um, my first one is on uh, MRD, and so it's great to see uh, your planned uh, LDT launch uh, later this year in colorectal cancer. Uh, when can we expect to see um, additional data which would support reimbursement, and have you had discussions with any Medicare contractors? And then my second question is on the Thrive Multi-Cancer Initiative. Uh, I appreciate that uh, additional data will be rolling out this year, but maybe, Kevin, can you just give us a sense you know, this is not like you're rolling out an LDT. This is kind of a higher risk, uh, bigger opportunity. Um, what types of, you know, factors do you think might change in the landscape over the next few years that could perhaps increase the probability of success? And then can you give us a sense for the size of the patient enrollment? Is it somewhere near the 80 to 100,000 plus mark? Okay, so the first question in terms of what are the things that are going to change to make uh, a multi-cancer early detection, this whole category of testing uh, more likely to be successful, certainly um, Congress creating a Medicare benefit uh, category is one. That's important. And uh, we expect that legislation um, to be reintroduced in this Congress. Uh, remember last year there were uh, more than 50% of Congress were co-sponsors, equal number of Democrats and Republicans. So we're working hard right now to make sure that Medicare beneficiaries uh, will have access to this incredible new category of testing. Um, uh, the evidence that is being built um, by uh, exact, by uh, others in this field, uh, shows uh, great promise for the ability to shift the uh, stage of cancer detection broadly across many, many different types of cancers. From later stage, more difficult to treat cancer, to earlier uh, cancers where uh, the therapy frequently is, is uh, surgery with, uh, with an intent to cure. Um, that's a big shift, and the more evidence that is uh, generated, uh, the, we, um, there is more excitement that is being built in this space. Uh, we believe that we have a significant um, uh, advantage because of the strength of our uh, color guard screening team, infrastructure, lab capability, et cetera, perfectly positions us uh, for success. Um, this is going to play out over uh, a long period of time. Uh, we believe there are well north of 100 million people in the U.S. alone, many more outside the U.S. that are going to benefit from the test. And, and the key takeaway here is that there is no therapy as effective as earlier detection. Earlier detection means your therapy plan is going to be very different. And uh, that's the goal of the program. We're excited about it. We're committed to making this happen. Um, and we're doing the work to, uh, the, the rigorous scientific work to develop the best test. Mark Ewell also asked on MRD. Um, so we plan to, to publish data in an upcoming scientific conference um, in the tumor-informed version of our test. We're called we're working on both tumor-informed and tumor-naive. Um, that tumor-informed data in colon cancer puts us one step closer to bringing that test to market, which we plan to do later this year, first as an LDT. Next year, we'll submit retrospective, prospective data uh, to MALDIX, hoping to secure reimbursement with that. Behind the scenes, we've been working on pivotal studies for both colon and breast. That eventually will help set, you know, we think, the standard for, for evidence in this space. Um, we feel good. Same thing with, with uh, multi cancer and leveraging the foundation we built in primary care. MRD, given our positioning with oncologists, um, whatever the team has done there, building deep, deep relationships. Um, as you know, 98% of all oncologists have ordered Octet DX from us. We, we think we can leverage that same strength of com the commercial foundation into MRD. Your next question comes from a line of Dan Arias from Stiefel. Your line is open. 
Afternoon, guys. Thanks. Kevin, back on the pipeline, just any update on the thoughts around commercialization for, for Cologuard 2.0? I think at one point that was a potential 23 event. So just curious if that's still a possibility and then how dependent on that would it, would, would commercialization be on just performance and data around the test versus other factors like sales training, reimbursement, et cetera? Thanks. Sure. We expect them to submit this year and it's at least six months with the FDA uh, before approval. So that puts us into next year with the launch. A lot of pre-launch activity will go on. Certainly um, that launch will incorporate the, the new and different sensitivity and specificity, uh, specificity. And then some of the more uh, mundane uh, aspects of launch would include um, the, the uh, billing code uh, for the, the new version of Color Guard, does it change, doesn't it change, payer relationships, Medicare, et cetera. You need to do, uh, do a lot of work there before you switch over to a new test. Uh, lab automation uh, changes, et cetera. So that will be a very thoughtful um, transition from the great current version of Color Guard to an even better version of Color Guard. The nice thing is, is we have a great test in Color Guard today, and it's uh, all upside for patients, health systems, and, uh, and exact sciences shareholders uh, when we bring the new innovation to patients. And just to add to that, re recall that late last year we, we pulled ahead one of the key benefits of Color Guard 2. We pulled ahead to internally what we called Color Guard 1.5. What, what Color Guard 1.5 did is it extended the stability of that patient sample by a third. That's important because it helps get more of those tests back to our lab uh, with a sample we can still use that's not ex that expired. Uh, so to date, um, this new version of the kit, uh, this new Colgate 1.5, has helped over 45,000 samples to come back to our lab without expiring. Uh, now, some of those we could have gone on to recollect before, but it, it, it creates an overall better patient experience, uh, more revenue for us, better gross margins for us. So uh, the team is not standing by idly by any means. They, they're pulling ahead. Uh, this big benefit. Overall, this year, um, that will increase uh, completed tests by at least a point. And then commercially, we're already there. We we know our targets, obviously, as Kevin said, with Colgard on the market now, um, it will be a seamless transition from a selling and marketing standpoint. Your next question comes from the line of Paneet Suda from SVB Securities. Your line is open. Uh, yeah, hi, Kevin, uh, Jeff. Um, thanks for taking the questions. So first one, is, you mentioned the 8% penetration mm -hmm. for 49, 45 to 49-year-old. What's the ceiling uh, for that penetration, given the momentum you're seeing here? And then on the MSED data, I mean, should we be expecting that at um, a CR or ASCO or uh, later in the year at SML? Thank you. I'll take the first part, Jeff. You take the second part. In terms of the ceiling, we think that the ceiling is higher than the 40% penetration that we've long guided to for public art, uh in that earlier age group because people who are 45 to 49 typically are busier uh, than retirees, and it's more of a challenge for them to schedule a screening colonoscopy, which can take a day and a half out of your life. Typically, you're, you're, uh, the portion of your week that you're normally working so um, we also have been able to educate and, and reach people digitally. Our digital investments and social media uh, marketing will increase over time. Uh, so Colgard is a test that fits within uh, their lifestyle. Do we get to six, 50 to 60% penetration? That wouldn't surprise me over time in that age group. Um, and what you're seeing is you're, you're seeing the endoscopy suites are very, very busy today. Any notion that Cologuard was going to um, slow down the business of uh, uh, gastroenterologists and uh, endoscopy suites is, is just not proven to be accurate. In fact, it's allowed them to focus. But there is, and there is uh, an opportunity for Cologuard, and it's being ordered more frequently in that patient population because the risk of colon cancer is, is lower and GIs are 
um, and health systems are focusing on getting those people screened, goes into their, their colon cancer quality uh, ratings through Colocar. Visiting um, uh, uh, last week with primary care physicians who have very busy practices, they are focused on Colocar. One office I met with switched 100% to Colocar. Why? Because the uh, GIs are so busy in that part of the country that um, they don't want to see more average risk patients. So we um, see that Cologuard will continue to, to grow because it's easy, it's at home, it's accurate. Jeff, I think there was a second part of that yeah, question uh, too. Please. This is Jeff. The MSA team was doing a really good job generating a wealth of evidence to help build up this new category. Um, as Kevin talked about, there's two sets of data coming this year. Uh, the first one, that I don't think we'll get ACR. I don't know the conference for sure, but I would think mid-year on the first set and then the fall timing for the second set. When we know what conference, though, we'll let you know. Your next question comes from the line of Patrick Donnelly from City. Your line is open. Hey, guys. Thank you for taking the question. Um, Jeff, maybe one for you just on kind of the cadence of the year coming out of the strong 4Q. Uh, you know, I know going, even going back to the conference in January, you were talking about, you know, 4Q had some benefits. I think you mentioned the billing enhancements on the call here. You know, no surprise, 1Q down sequentially on Colaguard. Can you just talk about, are we getting back to that normal seasonality? Obviously, again, 4Q had that great inflection. You talked about all the factors there. But how do we think about that going forward into 23? It's been a weird couple of years, obviously, in, in terms of the impacts you guys have seen. Um, so how do you think about the cadence of this year, you know, both on the top line with Colaguard and then also you know, maybe on the EBITDA side, if, if there's anything we should be looking out for there in terms of expense timing? Thank you, guys. So, Patrick, the, the typical cadence of Colaguard um, it, you know, hasn't changed. There, it's really driven by primary care utilization trends. So what those are is that you typically start the year um, if people are coming off the holidays, deductible is just reset. So primary care use is typically lower in January. Things build uh, up until Memorial Day uh, at the end of May. And then over the summer, they're typically flatter as people go on vacations and our focus is much on primary care. Then about mid-August or Labor Day, things pick back up um, and you know, typically climb pretty steeply until Thanksgiving timing and then slow down over the holidays as people go on to uh, get on to vacations. Uh, what that means for Colaguard, there's about a 30-day lag between a uh, primary care visit and we would recognize revenue. Uh, that's typically why you'd see a step down going from Q4 to Q1. Um, and I don't expect that to change going forward. However, our, our business is becoming more predictable. Uh, more predictable, you know, we've we got more stable uh, growth drivers, as Everett team have done a really nice job building out a whole wealth of different uh, drivers. It's not just tied to one thing anymore. Um, from an, uh, Q1 at this year's standpoint, there's a couple of unique things that are happening. Um, everybody's seen the flu data. The, the flu is, is really mild this year. Uh, relative to most years, the you know, flu is normally a, a headwind uh, to us and others in early Q1. Um, that headwind is really not existent this year. So I think almost equal, Q1 a little stronger this year. Also, some of the, the carryover benefits uh, that I talked about earlier from, uh, from enhancements to both our patient compliance engine and our, our billing systems. Um, we're picking up a little bit of, of, of catch-up revenue on both those things. Um, so all, all told, Q1 seasonally stronger this year. Uh, so as you think about phasing throughout the year, don't expect that, that same sequential build Q1 to Q2 um, this year uh, as you would normally. From an adjusted EBITDA standpoint, um, Q1 typically has the lowest profitability of the year uh, because of the, the top line being a little lighter seasonally and expenses are a bit higher as you roll into a new year. And we've got some unique uh, sales and marketing events in, in Q1 also. So, uh, so lighter profitability in Q1, uh, but overall strength to the year uh, from a profit standpoint. Again, significant pickup year on year and adjusted to the top. Your next question comes from a line of Andrew Cooper from Raymond James. Your line is open. Hey, everybody. Thanks for, uh, for sneaking me in here towards the end. Uh, maybe first, just Jeff, you know, you mentioned some of the prior peer collections and some of the improvements in compliance. Can you give us a sense for, for sizing of that in the fourth quarter? And then, you know, I think it was about a year ago, maybe this call last year, you talked a little bit about, you know, a chance for pricing and ASP to continue to climb a little bit. So can you just give us an update? You know, have you been able to capture a little bit more on, 
sort of apples to apples ASP and, and what that looked like and how that impacts the move to profitability as well, assuming pretty steep uh, drop down there. Andrew, in Q4, the, the, the base business uh, exceeds expectations. This is you know, the things that Kevin and I have talked about. It's the, the strength of the relationships with health systems, the, the Salesforce productivity, polar bear breeze screens, 45, all those things drove the upside. Um, the reason I called out some of these other items is because we didn't want people to take Q4 and then assume that's kind of the new base run rate going forward. Um, I look at it as more sweetener, sweetener in terms of um, a couple of things. Again, it's the enhancements to our billing systems, enhancements to patients' compliance. Um, what happened, you, let's say you, you turn those on early October. Well, because of those enhancements, we were able to, to capture patients and revenue that otherwise would have hit in Q2 and Q3. We picked up in Q4. Um, so it's, you know, a good guy there on a go-forward basis now, our revenue per test or ASP is higher. Um, and our patient compliance rate should improve on a go forward basis. Um, the, and you see it in other ways. You see it things like our, our DSO improvement improved by 15 days year on year. So overall, that team has made a, done a really good job at enhancing our overall kind of billing systems and good processes. On, on a runway basis, ASP for Cola Bear, the right way to think of this is around $480 of revenue per test. Uh, there are some puts and takes there. You, obviously, you've got this newer, uh, newer age group, 45 to 49, you know, for a while that was a, it, it carried a, a lower uh, revenue per test as we built up the insurance coverage. Uh, there's also some other classes like Medicaid that rightly so uh, come in about 80% of the Medicaid oftentimes. But again, to hear the team has done a nice job and longer term, I think we can work that, that rate towards, uh, towards $500. Your final question comes from the line of Dan Leonard from Credit Suisse. Your line is open. Hello. Uh, thank you for taking the question. So I have a question on your precision oncology guide. It doesn't seem like you're expecting much from Onco Extra. Is that accurate? And could you walk through the path for some of these new products like Onco Extra and MRD to contribute to the sales ramp and precision oncology? Thank you. Um, I could start, then maybe ever can jump in. Um, so what's baked into the, the PO guide globally, um, U.S., and we've talked about this for a long time, given the strong current market position uh, as a class, the, the penetration rate there is, is over 70%. Uh, we, we do a nice job uh, within that. Um, given that strong position, the growth in the U.S. for the Antitech DX business, uh, think of low single digits. This is prevalence plus maybe a point. Um, now, the, the strength of that foundation will allow us to launch other programs like Onco Extra, like MRD, uh, like the Risk Guard, which is the hereditary cancer product. Um, internationally, uh, the, the growth there is you know, that, that, that business, think of kind of $150 million uh, a year uh, right now. Um, growth there over time should be double digits for many years to come. Year to year can be a little different depending on which markets open up that year. Uh, this year, the big new market that we expect to come online is Japan uh, mid-year. Uh, so what's baked in is, is stronger growth in the U.S., but uh, it's, it's not that we won't get the full year impact from Japan. So it, um, it's not strong double-digit growth this year. It's, it's probably high single or gold double-digit uh, baked in. Onco Extra, uh, there I think it's, it's considered north of $10 million, um, of, of revenue this year. It is the first year of launch. I know that ever the team are, are excited about the launch, but it's early, so uh, we'll come back to you and you know, look forward to providing updates as the year unfolds there. I heard that they did. Yeah, I'll just add, we often talk about the productivity of our ColaGuard uh, sales and marketing team. My hat's off to our Precision Oncology sales and marketing team. We had the launch of Onco Extra a couple of weeks ago. Um, the training team and marketing team did a great job of preparing our sales organization to launch it day one. Um, and again, the granularity of who we're focused on, on who we need to drive Onco Extra, was really evident at our uh, at our sales and market at our launch of Onco Extra. And we're already generating orders. So as Jeff said, we're going to look to uh, hit exceed our target for Onco Extra in 2023. Yeah, and um, just to uh, understand the differentiation of Onco Extra. This is an enhanced version of a therapy selection test, which is an ultra-comprehensive panel. It includes DNA and RNA. Uh, it detects the clinically actionable mutations and fusions, including OLEXOME, whole transcriptome sequencing. Uh, it also includes patient-matched tumor normal sequencing. 
Um, and it has a incredibly easy to interpret result uh, reports uh, for um, FDA approved therapies, immuno oncology signatures, et cetera. Um, and then one thing, Dan, you didn't ask this question, but um, that I don't think we touched upon was around the uh, follow up uh, colonoscopy uh, rule changes. Everett, maybe you want to just touch on that. Absolutely. Thanks, Kevin. Um, one of the biggest objections from our customers around Cologuard was hey, if they get a positive Cologuard test, that patient is burdened with paying for the follow up colonoscopy. Um, CMS and commercial last year made the uh, positive development that there will be no um, uh, copay, zero copay for a follow up colonoscopy. Um, our organization is now focused on getting that message out. It takes time. Um, we have to educate over 300,000 primary care physicians and health systems on that new ruling. Uh, but we're really excited about that new development legislation, and we're out there every day uh, talking about the positive development. And this does conclude today's conference call. Thank you for your participation. You may now disconnect.